Um, so welcome to the session. It's called Lush. Um, it's nothing to do with the cosmetic brand. Um, Jade, who I'll hand over to in a moment, will explain um, the work that uh, Jade is doing on uh, around Lush, linking up suppliers and hubs. Um, there's a, a broader theme to this around food and farming and community. Um, my name is Dan Crossley. I'm the executive director uh, of the Food Ethics Council. We're a not-for-profit, all about, I guess, connecting people, joining the dots, um, which is why I'm interested in this, bringing people around the table, asking the hard questions, uh, and thinking about how we can all come together and try and tackle some of the tricky issues that are out there. Um, and in this space, we've, we've done work in the past around how can we build community food resilience? Um, how can we think of ourselves and treat each other differently, not as consume, helpless consumers at one end of the chain or some inverted commas, um, farmers that might feel very isolated at the other end of the chain. How can we recognize that actually that doesn't, it doesn't have to be like that? Um, I can say more about that later if there's time. But what I want to do is uh, hand over the floor to three brilliant speakers. Um, they're going to speak for sort of five to ten minutes each. Uh, and then I'll, I will be strict. And then there'll be plenty of time for questions. So please do um, be thinking of your questions. Short and sharp would be brilliant. Uh, questions, insights, examples stories, challenges, um, we'd love to hear them later. Um, so we're gonna hear from three people. Um, first thing you're gonna hear from Jade Bashford from the Real Farming Trust, uh, who's been working in this space for I think over 30 years. I'll let, let her explain Real Farming Trust and Lush. Uh, after Jade, we'll hear from Susie Russell from the CSA Network UK. Um, and then we'll finally hear from Kay Johnson, uh, who runs uh, a thing called the larder and has also been working in the space for over 30 years as a as a theme um so three brilliant brilliant speakers um i will hand over first to jade to tell you a bit about lush yeah does this one work yeah hi i'm jade jade bashford i work for the real farming trust my email's on that slide and i don't think they're going to be sent out to you so if you think you might like to have a go and you want to get in touch then take a photo and then you can contact me after uh, and I, I'll just point out John at the front who's been instrumental you'll know him already if you've had anything to do with pasture fed meat and he's helped with the pilot so I'm going to talk about Lush which is a gadget it's it's a model a method for linking up um, farmers with communities um, it's got more than one purpose it at best helps uh, someone who's direct retelling f food or flowers they might have a box scheme or be a farm shop or something like that. It helps them increase their sales without getting more customers. And it supplies really good quality food to people who might not otherwise be able to afford it. That's the purpose of Lush, which is a gadget to do that job. Um, so the context for this is that um, I, I work with people in food poverty and there's a lot of people in food poverty. Between 10 or 20% of households regularly skip food altogether. It's not that they're not eating vegetables on those days or that they're not eating organic food on those days. They're not eating food on those days. It's out of sight, but it's widespread. And there are an enormous number of food poverty projects trying to address that. Nearly all of them are urban, not much in rural areas. Pretty grim to be looking out over farmland and unable to afford to eat. But in urban areas, like in Manchester, there's 200 food banks. And they're very largely supplied by surplus food. Um, of course, that's not a fix to poverty. You're not in food poverty, you're in poverty. And a bag of surplus food doesn't fix the problem for you. It's not a bad thing to do, but it doesn't address food poverty or poverty. And it doesn't also address what's going on with surplus food. So there's huge numbers of projects reliant on surplus food. And there is supply chains now that work quite well for moving this food around. And if you are one of those food property projects reliant on surplus food, you don't know what you're going to get today. And somehow you have to come up with a bag of food that works for people or a meal that works for people. So it's very helpful for those projects to have some choice about the quality of food that comes on some days, or which day it comes, or whether it comes in the holidays or doesn't come in the holidays. So Lush helps supplement the food that those projects receive. On the other end, of course, if you're a farmer, you might be using a food bank yourself or working for less than minimum wage. You can't be giving food away. So you've got access to people with money if you've got well-meaning, well-off customers, and you've got good quality food, and you've got some control about where that food goes. But you're probably not very good at working in communities of need who would use that food. So Lush is a partnership 
between someone who's direct retelling good quality food or flowers and a community project that can use that food. Um, so, oh, I can do the next slide myself. This is how it works. It's very straightforward. You ask your existing customers to buy another one for someone that needs it. So you get the full retail price, you've got one customer, and they buy two things. That's a win for you if you're the producer. Then the supplier partners a food poverty project, and there's a dialogue and a connection, and you understand each other. The one that we set up in Stroud, it turned out, nobody knew this was going to happen, that the food poverty project was really into the offal that the farmer couldn't sell to his existing customers. So that dialogue matters. And then the food poverty project generates a social benefit with that food, which the farmer probably wouldn't have been very good at, wouldn't have even known who to give it to. So that's Lush. Um, there's some materials about it. Um, you want to take a quick photo of that if you want the materials, because they're free um, and you can use them. And I'm just about to show a video, and one of those links is to the video, and there's a little handbook. And if you want to do it, I'd like to hear from you, and I'll try and find you either a farmer or a community group to talk to. Okay, so now the next one's just a two-minute video. Um, from the case study in Stroud that John helped with to communicate what Lush is, um, partly to you, but also for you to take away and show to your customers or to other farmers um, who might be interested to try it out. I'm Andy, and we raise cows for beef on our family farm. The way we farm encourages greater biodiversity and captures more carbon than large-scale industrial methods. The meat is pretty good too. And my name's Sarah. I help coordinate the network of Stroud Hubs, NOSH for short. We're a group of organisations that have food pantries and we have community cafes where we all cook and eat together. I believe in our farming methods, but I'm up against big agribusiness and supermarkets, a huge economies of scale, marketing and logistic departments. I have to compete hard to reach my customers on my own. The food system is broken and we need change. At NOSH, we're not prepared to rely on supermarket surplus food, which often isn't appropriate nutritionally, and sometimes it's past its best. We, we need, need to find, find solutions. solutions. We got together over a meal at the farm. I told Sarah about our business, its strengths, and the challenges we face maintaining competitiveness as a small producer supplier, where we do everything ourselves, from farming, marketing, to distribution. And I told Andy about the NOSH network, how we've developed a way of targeting support for those people that most need it. We ensure that people get the healthy, nutritious food that they need. It became clear that we might be able to help each other. I asked my customers to buy a portion of meat for someone that needs it, and I received the full retail price. What we've set up is based on reciprocal benefits that reinforce each other's way of working, we build a stronger, more resilient and just local food system. Our relationship with suppliers like Andy means that we can offer people food with dignity. NOSH gets high quality, nutritious food that doesn't compromise on anyone's values. It's food that we wouldn't otherwise be able to afford to access, so it restores dignity. Lush is a win-win. It enables responsible food suppliers and food hubs to bypass supermarkets, strengthening our food system whilst putting food choices back into the hands of our community. Thank you very much. I've got I've got lots of questions. I'm going to hold them. Um, thank you very much for that, Jade, um, and a, a very very inspiring video. Um, that's what Lush does. We'll hand over to the uh, the next. Oh, we'll click on the next slide. Um, hand over next to Susie from CSA um, Network, which many of you will know. But Susie can perhaps very briefly explain what CSA uh, the CSA model is uh, and talk about yeah the benefits. That would be amazing. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, I'm Susie Russell. I'm the coordinator of the Community Supported Agriculture Network UK. So we're the only dedicated CSA support organisation in Britain. Uh, born in 2013, so we were 10 years old last year. My background's in community development, and I've worked in kind of arts, health, education, um, environment, and kind of increasingly been drawn towards food and food production. So nice to end up in community supported agriculture, which kind of ties all of those things together. Um, how many of you know what, or think you know what community supported agriculture is? 
Great. Okay, that's brilliant. A good lot of you. So I won't spend long on it, but just for those people who don't, um, we think there are about 250 CSA farms in the UK. They're food, fuel, or fiber producing businesses, and they're uh, direct sales. The majority of what is sold is produced on farm, so there is a little bit of buy-in, but tends to not be much. They tend to be year-round. Um, most of our CSAs are horticultural, but we also have flowers and um, yeah, fiber, fuel, herbs, meat, poultry, eggs, um, and dairy. And our strapline CSA is good for people, good for planet, and good for producer. So it looks after and builds local community. It looks after the planet and builds biodiversity. And it also pays the producer a good, steady, reliable wage. And that's because it's a partnership. So it's not just a transaction. It's you're becoming part of the farm. You're belonging to the farm as a member of a CSA. And that brings with it a whole host of benefits. Um, we've got a climate crisis, a mental health crisis. One in 10, only one in 10 children in the UK eat their five a day. Diabetes spend is set to overtake cancer spend in the near future because of poor diet. Um, and CSA brings a whole host of mental, physical, and kind of community social benefits. Um, so I just, if you, and I think what I've heard here and what I've been hearing in the last few years is just an increasing desire for connection, connection of people, connection to food, connection to land, reconnection to land, connection to roots, and all of those things can really come from a CSA. So if you want to support or engage or feel belonging or encourage belonging, start a CSA. If you're a landowner or a farmer and you have a patch of land, start a CSA. And that can be very hands-off as a landowner or it can be really hands-on. So we've got landowners who've, who rent a piece of land to a CSA and that then benefits their farm or farmers who have, are really hands-on in the CSA themselves. Start your own CSA if you're a grower or farmer and fancy it, or go and join your local CSA. Um, and then just on the next slide, I was just going to talk briefly about some of the ways that CSAs can connect and do connect people to food and to farming. And I think that's, we're, we're really disconnected to food as a, as a population. S school kids don't know what a carrot looks like when it comes out of the ground. I mean, it's, it's terrifying, really, and it's getting worse. And engaging people with food and with land and with growing food is so, so important if we're going to in any way reverse the sort of huge crises we're in. So what, does, what can CSAs do? They can encourage and support volunteers, especially from specific groups. They can host school visits, and they've just... Thanks to us and other people lobbying for it, we've seen the five hectare limit dropped, so uh, CSAs can now claim for school visits. They can host farm walks and other events, so you can really be a hub for food and community in your local area. They offer a way of direct sales, which cuts out all the money that goes to middle people, they're not just men, um, and to supermarkets, which we've heard a lot about already just this morning. Um, they can become mini food hubs and they can support other businesses. So we're seeing increasing numbers of, of farms and probably some of you in the audience will be part of or know a sort of collective enterprise farm where there are a range of different businesses all supporting each other on the same piece of land. And CSAs are really good at that all those businesses will bring in a different audience, which then is kind of fertile ground for other businesses. So they're gr a great part of a, a sort of food hub. Um, they can supply other local businesses, restaurants, they can do wholesale, you can offer farm to fork banqueting, they can support local organizations, and yeah, they, they enable connection. And for you, if you're a farmer, they can really offer company in what's quite a solitary, can be quite a solitary occupation and knowledge exchange. So I think that's really, that's all I'm going to say. I guess it's farming, particularly horticulture, is not massively profitable, as I'm sure lots of you know, but I did hear somebody recently saying uh, in a collective enterprise, I'm not exactly sure how the finances stack up, but what I do know is it's making me resilient. And I think in, in the world we're in today, building resilience, both resilience of land, but also resilience of community is ultra important. 
Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Susie. Um, and finally, we'll hear from Kay from the Lada. Kay, tell us, you can t as part of it, tell us what the Lada is. Well, I'll just tell you a little bit about me first, if that's okay. So I was brought up on a small farm in Lancashire, and uh, I spent a little bit of time as a chef and realised that was far too much like hard work. And um, so for the last 30 years, I've worked as a nutritionist, developing and delivering um, nutrition programs in low-income areas. A lot of that work has involved trying to get fruit and vegetables into children, uh, generally trying to create a demand for better food and making people aware of where the food actually comes from. So I set the larder up about 10 years ago and the strap line is food fairness for all. And one of our aims is to make fresh local produce affordable to people on low incomes without farmers bearing the cost. Now, I can see now how naive I was when I came up with that plan and couldn't have predicted how bad the situation was going to get. Um, we've got a cost of living crisis, uh, People are more and more people are going in, in, in poverty, as Jade mentioned, and production and food costs are going up. So anyway, I've set myself a challenge, and um, so for the last ten years, I've been I've been busy trying to find different ways of being able to make this possible. And one of the things that I've been doing is trying to create a sustainable food system at a local level in um, areas in, in Lancashire. Although one of the things that I seem to be spending a lot of time on at the moment is telling council people that it's not okay to give poor people waste food, which seems to be, it's a common misconception that food banks are the only way of addressing issues around food poverty, um, which, which um, yeah, Jane mentioned. So I'm going to, hopefully some photographs are on here, and I'll just use these to talk through some of the things that we do. So we, we work with farmers, um, and what we're trying to do is, is uh, bring farmers and the community together so we have Meet the Farmer events and days, and we also have cookery demonstrations and events on farms. This one here is was a lunch on a farm that we did, but we also bring uh, school children and families onto farms to do cooking sessions. Um, this is Marshall over here with his pumpkins. Now, every... Uh, year on November the 1st I get a call from Marshall to tell me that he's got lots of pumpkins that nobody wants because they think that they're only for making lanterns out of and uh, that's actually my dad Frank and he is retired now he was a farmer but he's always got lots of apples so I, I do get lots of people giving me um, they're glut. So, so what I do is to try and make use of them. One of the things that we do is we make chutney and other things. And then to, to generate an income to be able to then um, do some of the work that we do in the low-income communities, we have this what's called a solidarity model. So it's a little bit similar to the, um, the Tulosh, to the... the, the um, project that, J uh, that Jade's working on. So one of the things we do is we at Christmas, we do hampers full of local produce. We sell those hampers and with the profits, we do the work in the community. We also do outside catering. So um, that's my, myself and my colleague Alyssa and we were making curries and a lot of what we were making the curries out of was actually, was actually um, excess uh, veg that we'd been given from some of our farmers. One of the things that we do uh, with the funding is 
give vouchers for the local market to families. So this voucher scheme has been working really well since COVID. And um, you can see there we've got some thermal bags. And that's another project that we're working in with a project called the Sewing Rooms. And they're trying to tackle fuel poverty. So we're working together. Um, we have a food champion program. So I train people to be food champions to deliver sustainable and healthy food messages in disadvantaged communities. We do events to raise awareness about food. Um, we have, this is our Kids in the Kitchen program. The photographs on the, um, uh, on the, on the far right there are um, children going into the market to buy their, use their vouchers to buy the fruit and veg. And then we do face-to-face -face cooking classes and we also respond to needs. So during COVID, we uh, we work with a lot of farmers and far well farmers and partners, and we um, we got about fifty volunteers who helped us to deliver um, cooked meals out to the community when um, when COVID hit. So yeah, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, You've heard three, sto three stories, if you like, um, or three examples of uh, approaches that are, that are slightly different. They overlap in some areas, as we heard. Um, for me, there's, I guess, the kind of, the, the, the line I'd put above all of this is that, and we've, we've said this before, if it you know, giving, giving food without considering the structural reasons why food is needed is a never-ending battle. Um, and that we firmly believe in the power of people and communities, um, but we shouldn't put all the onus on people need to think about some of the structural reasons, some of the things that government, next government should do, et cetera. So we take that as, as read. Um, if we think about what some of these different models and approaches are, um, I mean, it strikes me that there's a, there's a common theme amongst this about, about connection and community and farming and um, how connected or disconnected farmers feel from the communities in which they live or vice versa, how uh, connected or disconnected communities feel from, from farmers and farming and growers. Um, and I'd love to hear, I guess, questions, examples from people in the room who are uh, who, who either questions of the panel or things that you'd like to share very briefly. Examples, I guess, of uh, of of where you you might you might be doing something or you might know of others doing something in your local community that you think is working working well uh, and that others can learn from. So, I guess I'm opening the floor up um, again. We've got a, a microphone there. Um, we'll start. Start, we'll start over this side, um, just yes, this side over here, uh, and then we'll work our way over. Try, we'll take kind of a collection of questions or comments or examples on this side. Um, we'll start with the, lady, the person with the hand up just, just at the front there, yeah. Uh, just a quick question for Kay. I'm quite interested in how much your, your pro how you do your pricing on the meals that you're selling at your events. So when we do outside catering, their events for people who can afford it. When when we do um, our meals in disadvantaged communities, we don't charge for those because we are generating an income through the other um, uh, projects that we work on. Thank you. So again, happy to take clarification questions or specific questions of people. Um, and or to take um, examples or things you want to share. Yeah, person there. Hiya, thanks for that. Um, so I um, am a mother of three and um, have a background in human nutrition and really passionate about getting nutritious food to people um, on low incomes. And I spent two years working for the food bank and I'm now a farmer with a direct sales business doing livestock. And um, I guess my question is that my current passion is... Um, <laughs> I'm kind of really angry about the um, absolute crap that they're feeding my kids at school and um, trying to work with our local educational MP on um, trying to get more nutritious food into our schools and I'm sort of every turn coming up against opposition. Um, our local schools are run by a bigger group, Compass Group, and I wondered if anyone had any recommendations on procurement and how to get that yeah, supply chain. Okay, thank you. We'll come come to you. Let's take another question. So that was about nutritious food and how we, uh, particularly thinking about schools, how we get that into into our schools. 
Um, let's take Andrew there. Thanks, uh, Andrew Stark from the Eating Better Alliance. Um, one question for Kay and Jade about the relationship with Trussell Trust and maybe that more established network of dealing with poverty and food at the moment and how they perceive your alternative model. And then a question for the whole of the panel about the future of your alternative ways of doing things and what you maybe foresee that looking like, particularly with the Labour government or maybe a future Labour government which isn't moving on things like the two-child benefit for ben a two-child cap on benefits and some of these more social welfare alternatives which would help move things along the poverty journey. And I suppose um, just thinking about whether your examples, as brilliant, brilliant as they are, um, hopefully we have less poverty and then less reliance on these sorts of more survival modes that we see in our current food system. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you. Two good questions. So we'll we'll come to some more questions in a moment. I just want to come to the panel. Um, maybe we start start at the far end with Kay and come along. So there was a question, that question about nutritious food in, in schools in particular, and then maybe anything you wanted to say to, to Andrew's question about yeah uh, alternatives and how how Trussell Trust and others might see you and or the f the future of of, of the sort of altern alternative in inverted commas that you're you're building. Yeah, just in relation to the uh, food in schools, is your um, do you have a sustainable food places group in, do you know, in the area? Um, it might be worth trying to find out because I um, think there's a, it could probably, you could possibly get support there to then lobby your, whoever, you know, the education department or, or the schools. Um, so check out sustainable food places and see if you've got a, um, a local group. Thank you. And, and yeah, have you come across sustainable food places before? Actually, no. So it used to be called Sustainable Food Cities. It's a collaboration between three organisations all about, and they're, they're across many parts of the UK, not all parts, but many parts, and an amazing network where they're doing, doing exactly that kind of thing. Um, Susie, Susie. Yeah, I was also just to say on the schools, um, Labour have promised that 50% of public procured food will be sustainable or local. Unfortunately, not sustainable and local, but trying if if it's a Labour government holding them to that and putting pressure on them around that is really important. And there have been some really good pilots in Wales, in the southwest of Wales, around courgettes and now other um, organic food going into school procurement. So it's worth looking at that and bringing those lessons back to England. And does anyone in the in the audience have to that question about nutrition in schools? That's a whole whole big area. We won't be able to dive into detail. But is there one person in the room that's is a person at the back. Um, sorry, I'm making... What, sorry? Chefs in Schools. Yeah, Chefs in Schools. I mean, there's a whole bunch of initiatives and organisations out there. Chefs in Schools is, is, a, is a great one. Um, School Food Matters. There's a whole bunch of organisations in that space that are doing, doing amazing work. Um, yeah, and I think the person said you could find them afterwards. The person at the back with the... Uh, yeah, waving. Um, did, Jay, did you want to come in on, I guess, that sort of future of alternative ways that Andrew was talking about or sort of how you see... In, in the context of Lush, um, I think you, I've heard you describe it before. I think in other contexts as a, as a recognizing it sort of to some degree a sticking plaster. Um, it is. It's yeah. a sticking plaster. It's not good enough. There shouldn't be people who can't afford to eat the food they want to eat. And Lush doesn't fix that problem and it's not good enough. If I, if I could think of something that did fix that problem, I'd be doing it. So hopefully people will no longer be so poor that they can't afford to choose the food. They shouldn't be. There's no need for it. It's completely unnecessary. Um, however, I think the social eating and community activity around food is fantastic, irrespective of that other problem. So I hope that does continue, and I hope that these alternative supply chains that have built up over the last two or three years in response to food poverty, mainly shifting surplus food, actually will be useful. There are people making ready meals, there are people with bicycles and WhatsApp groups and warehouses and forklifts, actually moving quite large quantities of food. So even if we can do away with poverty, it's not food poverty, it's poverty. If we can do away with poverty, still some of that structure might have a value. And Kay, did you want to say anything on that briefly? Yeah, I just wanted to mention about food banks. So I do actually work with food banks and we provide training for volunteers and people using the food, uh, food banks get... Um, 
offered uh, cooking classes. But one of the things I wanted to mention was food buying co-ops. And they were around when I, when I was... Uh, when I first started working as a nutritionist, there were there were everywhere community food buying co-ops, and and that's something that I'm working with to try and reintroduce. I feel like that's a that's a next step for for me. Thank you, and uh, and to Andrew's question, there are as as you'll know, there are lots lots of different models, lots of different organisations working in the space. Trust Trust is one, and, and very well known in the food bank space, and they shifted their goal from a few years ago of let's have a food bank in every town and community to let's end the need for food banks um which for me was a very welcome shift um but they yeah i can't speak for them as to what their perception is of, of different models but i know that there are yeah there are there's the independent food aid network there's a whole bunch of organizations in this space different different kinds of uh, approaches um to, to addressing that but we need to think about structural reasons um and right let's open it up again for otherwise i'll ask some of my questions anyone else like to come in um let's take the question just on the edge there please Hi, um, those are really interesting initiatives. Um, one thing I want to share with you is I'm, I love the voucher program because uh, I've always had this, I used to live in the States and the Department of Agriculture does a food stamp program. And I always thought that a you know, national food stamp program for people maybe on universal credit um, that they could only use to buy fresh food, preferably directly from farmers or markets, uh, would be a great idea. Um, so maybe you want to comment on that, but I, I want to ask you to think at the macro level as well, because if we've got you know 20, uh, 250 CSAs, um, you know your UK doing this voucher program with the with a whole bunch of other things, and I know there's an organisation in London doing it, but in a situation where farmers only get about 10% of the value of the food supply chain in this country, and supermarkets control 95% of the distribution how can we actually scale up this kind of access to food that allows you to go around the middlemen, have the farmers get paid a reasonable amount of money for producing good food, and then that good food is not accessible only to people who can afford to go shopping in farmers markets, it's accessible at scale to people actually whose health outcomes are very dependent upon it. Thank you. Um, we'll take that question in a moment, have a think about that. Um, there was a, I think there was another hand just behind somewhere or to the side there. Hello, thank you for just sh sharing about the amazing work that you're doing. My question might be slightly out of ignorance, but I'm just very interested to like know more about the logistics behind connecting farmers with community projects. So it's something that I've been thinking about um, in my own work and sort of starting to explore more about. and. Yeah, just wondering how, like, um, yeah, how you're able to, like, what are some of the logistics behind, for example, transporting that food or making that food available to community projects? Um, yeah, that's my question. Great, thank you. That's some more excellent questions. Thank you. We'll come over to this side again in a moment. So just to tee up for the next question, then we'll come back over there. Um, so there's questions about um, what do we think of the idea of national food stamps, like they have in the U.S. Uh, questions, more macro level question about how can we scale up or perhaps, dare I say it, tweak, um, replicate or spread some of that good stuff so it's happening, um, not necessarily at scale it might be, but how can we replicate that in lots of places? Um, and final sort of practical question about the logistics of, of connecting farmers with community projects and, and connecting community projects with farmers. Um, should we start, Jade, did you want to come in on one of those? Uh, vouchers are a bit controversial. I think in some ways they're fantastic. If my salary was paid in vouchers, especially vouchers I could only spend on a certain kind of food, I'd be quite pissed off. So I think there is a case for cash first, but it's a bit tricky. If you've got lots of calls on your cash, you're already in debt, you haven't paid your electric, and the kids haven't been fed, maybe there's a case for protecting some of the money for spending on food. I don't know. I think I'm probably I'm not the right person to ask the question to. I think probably that question should be put to people who are in that circumstance. What, what works best? Do you want to have cash or do you want to have a voucher? On the other two questions, I think they're related. The logistics question is scaling up. I think it's not very well noticed that supply chains have changed quite a lot because there are 200 or more food banks in each city now. There's a lot of food being moved around and it can handle, those supply chains can handle food that supermarkets wouldn't take 
and they work at scale. They can deal with it. If you turn up with a truckload of courgettes in August, they know what to do because they're used to dealing with whatever turns up off a fair share lorry. So there is some potential there, which people aren't talking about very much. And there are distributors of all this surplus food who can take whatever it is you bring to them. So you could bring them food that you'd paid for by Lush or some other means. Um, and they, they, there's already trucks going out to all the food poverty projects through Fair Share or Felix or these kinds of organizations. So um, there's a list of them on the links, or you can email me if you're looking for a way. Or you might just have to make a one-to-one -one arrangement with someone who's distributing food new, so near somewhere you already drive to. It might be just a conversation one-to-one -one between one farm and one project. There isn't a one-size-fits-all, I don't think. Thank you. Um, Susie, did you want to pick up on... One yeah, of, I was one of those. Uh, just going to respond to the sort of second scaling out point. Um, I mean, I think there, there, are, uh, there are lots of different things that will enable scaling out, and some of those are policy-based and sort of further from reach. But maybe one of the most important, I mean, for CSAs, the most important marketing tool is word of mouth. So if you're part of a CSA talking to everybody you know about it and encouraging them to sign up, or if there isn't a CSA to form a group and start one, um, just, yeah, getting CSAs on the ground. CSAs are remarkably resilient because they are kind of without the policy framework. We are campaigning for more support for CSAs, but actually they've been managing for years with no support from the government and managing remarkably well. And they're also, because they grow, typically the horticultural CSAs grow a range of crops, a really big range of crops. They're also pretty climate resilient because they're growing such a, a range of stuff. And in terms of kind of making, we did some work recently with around inclusion in CSAs. They, they aren't very inclusive. They're largely white and middle class, both in terms of membership and in terms of farmers and growers. We we're kind of looking at the reasons and, and some of those are kind of cultural and social, um, encouraging different groups to start their own CSA. But also there are some interesting kind of, there's some solidarity models, like uh, there's one that was developed in Holland where you pay for your share. If it takes an hour to create your share, that's all the admin and growing and harvesting and distribution, then you pay what you earn an hour. So it's kind of a way of balancing out, um, which is a, it's a really interesting model and works when there's not too big an inequality gap. At the moment in this country, there is a huge inequality gap. But if, as hopefully things may start to sort of even out a bit, those models come into their own. Thank you, yeah, and Kay, thank you. Yeah, I actually agree with Jade about the uh, the voucher situation. I'd rather have enough money to be able to buy whatever food I wanted to. The reason that we do the voucher scheme is because during COVID, people couldn't come to our cooking classes. So we developed a series of online courses so people were able to go um, we, we worked with a particular market stall holder who was sourcing their produce from local farmers. And so we, we, so we were kind of killing two birds with one stone by supporting the farmers and, and, um, and the families by giving them vouchers so that they could then go home and um, uh, do the cooking class online. Now... After COVID, we offered face-to-face -face classes, so now people have a choice between face-to-face -face or online. Quite a few people want to wanted to continue with that, but it is, a, it is a choice that they have now. I can't remember what the other question was. Well, well so it's a scaling up question, or a, yeah, that, that anything else on logistics, that practical thing about connecting farmers with community projects? And I think that's, we were talking about this earlier, it always comes to funding. The, the projects that I've worked on have always relied on quite small grants. And when that funding runs out, it's impossible to carry them on. We need, we need more funding, we need more investment in, into, into, into scaling up, I think. We know that things work, we just need to and I take it like chair's prerogative, a quick question from me um, linked to that. But there's, there's through what you've all been saying, there's a, a need for, uh, there's lots of benefits in, in the round for greater connection between between all of us, between farmers and, and farmers are part of communities ultimately, um, but between community groups, between um, farmers, growers and others. Um, so connection generally is a good thing. What are the ingredients, if you like, that enable 
better connection to to flourish if that's not too big a deeper question and i want to and, and you said like having the funding and support networks is part of that because it doesn't doesn't necessarily happen on its own but is there anything you wanted to add to that Kay? i think it takes quite a long time to build trust in in communities in both farming communities and um and in some of the um more disadvantaged communities where people are um the they're faced with so many different problems that um and quite often feel let down so it's, it is quite hard building up that trust it takes time yeah thank you anything jade jade or susie jade? i think two things i think you need an intermediary that you all of us tend to exist in our bubbles and it's actually really difficult to talk to someone you never normally talk to so you need someone in the middle john was that person in one of the cases you need someone who actually knows more than one world and will make an invitation and set up a situation for the conversation to happen and then you need a reason so i guess that's one thing i like about lush is it it benefits both parties to interact with each other because there's a purpose in that interaction so yeah that's my answer Thank you. Susie? Yeah, I was just going to add, I mean, I think from a CSA perspective, not everybody wants to, not everybody wants to be social and that's fine. And some farmers are really happy being solitary and some would like more interaction. And it might be that you want to be solitary, but there's a bit of your farm that might be a CSA and someone else does the engagement. So I guess it's just also being honest about what works for you. And if, if you don't want to be that person out there chatting then maybe there's someone else that might be doing that. Thank you. We've got something like 10, 10 just over 10 minutes left. I want to get, there was a, there was a question from this side of the room. Have you, is the microphone over here? Or not? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, so, sorry, put your hand up again, please. Sorry, yes. Uh, so we'll take one question here. I know there's a question over there, which I'll come back to, and then a question from John. Um, but do, do, I'd also love to hear, like, quick fire in 10 minutes after we've had these questions. Would, uh, examples of, I say it might be farmers and growers in the room who are doing doing something at a very local level with their community that they want to shout about um, very briefly, uh, or those that are working in community organisations that are connected in with their farmers. I'd love to just hear one or two examples from people in the, in the audience, if we have time. Before that, last round of questions. Thank you. Um, I'm Megan Sherwood from the A-Team Foundation, and we fund what we call Enlightened Agriculture. Um, I'm interested to hear about how these models allow us into areas that are called food deserts, um, areas of deprivation where they only have access to fast food, ultra-processed food. How can these models help us get real fresh food that is nutritionally dense um, into communities that maybe don't have the, the time for cooking or the skills required to prepare it or even the facilities in order to prepare it, like access to ovens or freezers or those kind of things? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Megan. Good question. We'll hold that one. We'll take the other. There was an, a question, I think, from John. Is it John? John here at the front, and then we'll take the question at the back afterwards. Thanks very much. I'm John from Pasture for Life and worked with Jade on the thing. One of the things, Jade, I think, um, you remember Penn Rashbas, who is one of our farmers. Interesting, is a, a GP who's now become a sheep farmer and, and covers that uh, link. But she's been doing a lot of research into looking at where, how we might replicate this elsewhere. And I think a couple of things that came back were one, a lot of these hubs wanted volume and they didn't really want to have a small amount of meat or whatever. And others um, didn't want meat either because they were vegan or because um, they didn't have the refrigeration capacity to do that. So I don't know if you, just perhaps a couple of thoughts on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take that, we'll come to that in a second. Um, and then, We'll take, there's a final question there, uh, the person at the right at the back, on the right-hand side, as we look. Thanks very much. My name is Leah. I'm a PhD researcher with the UK Food System Centre for Doctoral Training Programme. Um, fascinating examples of what's happening at a community level. I was wondering, from, from a research perspective, what are the gaps that you see um, being really important to fill in what you're doing, especially that would be helpful to obtain um, bigger pots of funding, and the challenges that you have perhaps connecting with the research community? Thank you. Thank you. So there was a question about food deserts and how these models can help provide fresh 
nutrient dense food to, to uh, those communities and those, those people living in those areas. Question about I think about volume from John, um, and then a question about research gaps um, that that would maybe provide some of the evidence that might help with funding, etc. Um, should we start with Susie? Yeah. Uh, CSAs at the moment aren't doing a lot in food deserts. It's something, uh, they tend to be rural. They are increasingly peri-urban and with the odd urban one. Um, but it's something we're looking at how, and there are growing communities in London to some extent kind of crosses that bridge between rural farming and, and inner city. Um, I think CSA can do that, but we're kind of working out how can we make CSA a reality in, in cities. So yeah, it's a really good question. Um, the volume one I'm not going to try and answer uh, the research gaps I think there's I mean increasingly health like and I mean certainly at a policy level it's like people are working in silos there's so little connection between health education food farming so evidence around the kind of social and health benefits of this kind of farming I mean more widely regenerative agriculture small agroecological community invested farms definitely have huge i mean we know from the research we do through our annual member survey that it i mean we've got um spoken evidence of the impacts it has on people but a sort of wider research paper around that i mean one of our farmers in scotland did some economic and uh, environmental and health analysis of his csa and he reckoned if he was paid for his carbon capture and health, he'd be earning 40 grand more a year than he is. So, yeah, it was a sort of interesting, but obviously he's not earning that. Thank you. Um, Jay, did you want to come in on the other volume question or, or the research yeah, gap question? So, um, on food, does it, I think Lush works quite well because it partners a neighborhood organization in an area that's deprived, that, that's running the toddler group or giving benefits advice. Mm, I think there are areas where there's a desert of social fabric as well, often in the same place. And they're really areas where we need to start making relationships. And I think food is a good way of beginning that. I, th I think food's a way into a place where people don't know and trust each other and aren't doing anything. Um, I work on another project for the Real Farming Trust that's called Twinning, which also works really well in that situation. And that project pairs um, community groups who are both doing something on food but don't know each other at all. They're completely separate. In each case, one urban and one rural. So, for example, the Somali kitchen in Bristol, they're really into cooking Somali food. They never go to the countryside. And they're paired with a farm. And now they're making relations and doing stuff together. So I think that's a really interesting model, the twinning one. Um, and your question, John, there are millions of food hubs and food poverty projects, and they're all different. Some only ha handle huge volumes. Some only open every third Tuesday and only want one box of food. Some do meat, some are vegan, some have got a freezer, some have got a cooker. It's a pain to try and match whatever issue you've got to offer with the right thing. An intermediary helps, and there are some of those kinds of organizations listed in the handbook. Um, and as for research gaps, um, I think there's loads of research. It's perfectly obvious what the problems are. And we can make even more evidence, say, to the policymakers, until they actually want to fix the problem. Even more data is not going to help, I think. But there is a real gap, I think, between research and practitioners. I want, I want my work to be evidence-based. So I, I think also the practitioners need to talk to researchers. And I think the funders need to understand when they're asking for unreasonable data that puts another burden on the people trying to do the work on the ground that if the funds are asking it for evidence of work that's needed on the ground that requires money spending on research, they've probably made a mistake. And the funders should probably go and talk to the people who they think they're trying to benefit and ask what they want. The missing voice is always the beneficiary, isn't it? The money goes to the researcher. And really, we need to be spending time in communities of need just listening, I think. Sometimes we need to reimagine what we what is generally constituted as, inverted commas, evidence um, for policy, etc. And re, yeah, reimagine that and... Think about the lip, bring in the lived experience voices, and there's much more. Um, okay, finally from yourself. Yeah, I'm really glad that you asked the uh, food deserts question because I forgot to mention that in my presentation. So I'm currently working in a place called Skemmersdale, which is surrounded by the best horticulture land in the country, 
um, and um, we have a you know, the, you know amazing produce. Um, and in Skemmersdale, there isn't anywhere to buy it, and there's a lot of, a lot of poverty there. And one of the things that I'm working with partners in that area is to do is to set up a community food buying cooperative so that the people, we have people, um, we're engaging with schools and uh, children's centres and and um, the, so the, the, the plan is to set up a community buying cooperative so that there is that access and interestingly enough, we're working with Edge Hill University with a researcher and it's actually, it's been really difficult to meet the, fun, the research criteria um, and to get that to connect with what actually we need to happen. And it, we're kind of getting there. But I think um, if, if, yeah, if, if researchers have, I would ask um, that, yeah, we could may, maybe spend more time discussing what's needed in community settings. Uh, I think that would help. Thank you very much. Um, we're almost out of time. Uh, I might come to the panel with one, I haven't I'm put them on the spot, with one kind of closing message they might want to give to the audience, not in terms of claiming to have all the answers on the panel, I don't think any of us claim to have all the answers, but just one kind of final key thing you'd like to, it might be a repetition of something you said before, um, while you're thinking of that. I guess just, um, are there any other, so we've only got a couple of minutes left, is there any other, anyone else in the room that's in the, I guess in the farming, um, hopefully, farming and growing space that is, that is 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 or knows of um, some something positive that's happening in terms of connecting with local communities. In, it could be in a whole host of different ways. It could be from direct selling and beyond. Um, I'd love to just hear. Sorry, I'm making making you run around. Apologies. But, um, so yeah, person here for four rows back. I think um, just very briefly. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Jenny Shropshire Good Food Partnership, and I just wanted to share very briefly where part of the sustainable food places movement and the role that we're able to play in connecting growers with organizations working on food poverty so whether it's supporting growers to set up a pay it, pay it forward scheme or just kind of matchmaking so if you do know yeah there's sustainable food partnerships right across the country they can play that really critical intermediary role that um, jade was alluding to thanks Thank you. Yeah. So this has to a lot. of This has to happen inevitably, at place-based, uh, quite a, a kind of localized level. And there are there are lots of networks uh, to tap into. So please do take advantage of those. Um, I'm gonna. I'll say my final kind of thirty seconds sum up in a moment. But I'm gonna ask each of them to say one thing very briefly. One either one insight you've taken from, or one thing you want to share with the audience. What would be your your one thing? Um, should we start with? Let's go this way along, Jade. Um, I, I think I want to implore all of us to go and listen to people you don't normally meet and see what it's really like. Your assumptions, all of us, are certainly wrong. And if you're an organisation, partner an organisation you'd never normally even talk to and try and do a project together. That, that's fine. Thank you. Susie? Um... I wanted to say thank you all for being here and being interested in this topic. And I guess my, yeah, think about the things you do in your, you know, how you consume and interact with food that you celebrate and love and share them with the people closest to you. And then, you know, think about how the other people in your community and further away from you do those things too. I mean, that's, yeah, it's probably the biggest thing we can do is think about our own choices and share and celebrate thank you okay yeah i well you kind of <laughs> i wanted to say that it, yeah i think i feel like um it's been yeah it's been a pleasure actually you know being able to answer the questions and and know that people are genuinely interested i i'm often working away and i and i'm not always aware that you know people are that interested in what i do so yeah thank thanks very much Thank you. And just by way of close from me, firstly, um, I, I from a Food Ethics Council point of view, we are I said, very interested in prom how, did, how can we, the collective we, not us as a small organisation, but encourage and promote more of that, as I said, community food resilience from the bottom up, but at the same time, recognise that we need changes in that, in the policy and surrounding environment that 
um, we'll wait and see what the next government uh, brings. But um, the, the whole, I guess, the, the thing that I said unites all of this is this thing about connection. And we talk at the Free Ethics Council, perhaps it sounds slightly idealistic, but about collective flourishing. So not just let's not kind of get uh, too stuck in the me, me, me um, and think about how can we are. We are all part of communities. We are all part of um part of that you know can be part of creating that positive change so that's that sounds a bit glib but um but feels really important and, and how can we create uh make sure we're not not building lock-ins if you like and building dependence dependencies into the system very geeky thing to say but and how can we yeah how can we empower and enable people so that everyone can participate and everyone can connect um and i loved just i loved jade's comment about a, there's a desert of social fabric which is something i wrote down i like that phrase it's a it's a bleak but i think it's it's very true so um yeah please go forth and connect uh, please do um connect up with with all of our speakers afterwards um and yeah please do go and enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully uh, you'll be uh, feel part of part of a community here at groundswell and people in this room because you've been brilliant at sharing examples and questions so thank you to you and a big thank you to jade susie and kate